Hello, my name is Derek Main. I review translated literature and welcome back to my channel. So today I'm really excited for the review. We are going to take a look at An Orphan World by Giuseppe Caputo, translated by Juana Adcock and Sophie Hughes, and this is from Charco Press, and it also is the winner of English Pen Award. I think I've mentioned that Charco Press is now has a distribution deal in the United States, which is really exciting. And I'm gonna, what is going on with that? Who knows if that's even better. Um, so they have a new distribution deal in the United States, so now we're gonna be able to get their books. Um, beforehand, like with this one, the first title of theirs I've actually read, um, I would have to get my independent bookseller to go through the British distributor, and of course it's like a little expensive, takes a longer time. Anyway, I'm really excited. And what's what's interesting is that so I had heard about Fish Soup, Die My Love, um, Strange Loops. I think I might be saying the title wrong, but I had seen like, you know, it through my Twitter feed and booksellers and publishers and readers, viewers, a lot of excitement about some of their titles, but I had not seen a lot on An Orphan World. In fact, I chose and bought this title specifically because one of the people I follow on Twitter who's a London bookseller whose name I'm going to, I think it is, I think it is Gary, and I, I'm looking now on my phone, which I know is fantastic, Gary Michael Perry, which is fantastic content, but um, he had some really glowing reviews for it, and I, something about the way he said it, the father-son relationship, um, I really wanted to read it, and wow, I, I waited to review this book. Because I wanted to be in the right headspace to really speak about it cogently, um, hopefully intelligently, without too much emotion. Because this is a very emotional read. It's a must read. I recommend it very, very highly, as strongly as I can, you know, recommend um, one of the books that I read. And you'll also hopefully through the review be able to see if it is for you because it is a little different. Of course, it's translated literature. That's the whole beauty of this world is that it's all a little different, a little weird. Well, let me tell you quickly. So the plot of this is a father and son that live in unfathomable poverty. I was about to use the word indescribable poverty, but it's obviously described and <laughs> described very well. But unfathomable. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, they live in just the wrong side of the tracks or they're sort of barely struggling to make end meet, ends meet. It's just a sh It's a step worse than that. I mean, the poverty just overwhelms you in their situation. You know, this is a father and son that have to, you know, pawn a lamp for food and, and slowly have to give up their furniture and, and any material things and, and rely, of course, on the kindness of, of strangers. But those strangers are in the same neighborhood and even the friends that are in the same neighborhood, so they're not strangers, are also poor, you know, and it's just, it really it is deeply affecting because of course, not of course, but their relationship is one of such love and grace and beauty and the two of them going through this world together, I could have read for another 500 pages. It is beautiful. It is the kind of book that is filled with sadness filled with terror because of the violence aspect of the book, but also filled with hope. And that really sticks with you. And I don't mean this sort of like neoliberal idea of like, oh, look at these poor people lifting them, themselves up because that's absurd. I mean, the hope is internal to them. It belongs solely to them and specifically to the sun who I'm going to peg in his mid-twenties, but I could be totally wrong. But let's just say in my mind as I was reading it, that's where he was at, you know, and the father in his, you know, say 50s. So that we can't even as readers, you, you know, that hope isn't ours. It is not transmitting a message of hope to say here and everything is going to be okay. And now you can release this weight as a reader that you have had reading about people in these situations, you can now feel feel okay about it. It's fine, don't worry about it because there's hope. No, the hope it belongs 
to them and specifically to him and it is theirs and it is a private thing. Even as you're reading the hope, the bits that there are feel like a private thing. So they live in this unfathomable poverty and the story is about the different very creative and imaginative schemes that the father is trying to come up with to get them out of this. And then the relationship, of course. And then also the young man's sexual awakening. And through that, there is an eroticism that we'll talk about in a moment. But it's also, it's also something that has a tinge of violence because of homophobia, because there feels on the edges like there is something that the son must be wary of. So it's scary, even though it's exciting and wonderful. But if it was just a straight person, right, then we could only focus on that lovely. But here there's that other element because of who he is that is difficult to read, difficult to process because it exists completely in our own world. We see it constantly and it's given such a glorious treatment in this book, that coming of age time for a young man. So those are the two elements of the story, let's say, and it's a great, a great journey. So first, before I get into, I have three specific things highlighted that I want to sort of themes, thoughts I had. The words I have written down are lights, sexuality, and play. But before we get to that, I do want to read a few passages. They're all very short, mostly just sentences, because I was blown away at the translation of this. And again, you know, you never have a great sense of like how much is the author, the translator, you know, when you don't, when you're like me and you don't speak the original language and can't go back to the original work. And this, it's interesting, was translated by two people. And I've seen that some, I think one of the Via Matis, actually, which I think Sophie Hughes was one of the translators, which is interesting. I would love to know the technical aspect of that and the artistic aspect of that, of how two people go about translating a work. Is it a group project, <laughs> like in school? Like, okay, you do this half and I'll do this half. It's clearly not because it's so uniformly what language or are there aspects of language that one translator has a better grasp of and so they're kind of there for that uh, are you both creating your own simultaneously and then we get together one day and say okay well i like this and i like that again i don't think that's the way it happened based on how it's read but that's really interesting to me when we have two translators and again the more artists that are in a pot to create something like this i always love so we're going to start off page 39. I don't know why this little sentence stopped me in my tracks. I think it's because it it seems wrong, like something you're not supposed to do. So I'll give one sentence before and then. Little by little, as more people leave the neighborhood, Pa is growing darker. The disturbances disturbed him. In this new silence, he's fallen silent. I, I, I loved that so much. The disturbances disturbed him. It, it, that repetition there, it kind of speaks at like, it's not like there were disturbances, you, you, you know, like it's saying like there were disturbances and they disturbed him. So it one implies that other disturbances in the past that have come through his life have not disturbed him. They are disturbances. They have not disturbed him. But, but it also amplifies that too, right? Like it's, it's also saying just sort of like it's this big of a disturbance. The disturbance has disturbed him. I should say that six times fast, right? In this new silence, he's fallen silent. And I love that because again, we have the repetition, which is that thing writing wise, I think like you would be told like, oh, don't do that. You know, you don't need to, but I love it. And in the silence, in this new silence, he's fallen silent. So there, not only the repetition, but also like he is, he is seeping into his environment, the pain and the sadness, and in this case, the silence of his environment, he is becoming sort of a piece of furniture with. And I, lo I loved that. So page 48 is again, we're gonna go just, this is just about the writing and the translating, you know, that I'm highlighting here. And this is another example as all of this took place and shown, 
I felt that in the city, existing and shining were the same thing. Again, I mean, I don't have much to say about that other than it stopped me. You know, it stopped me. I dog-eared. I highlighted. Existing and shining were the same thing in the city. And we'll get a little more to that when we talk about lights and sort of the thematic element of that and how important it is. But I, I love that. I love that phrasing. Page 175. This is something that comes up a lot. And I think that if anyone who has studied poverty has has noticed, which is that time feels different. Um, for those of us who are um, wealthy and blessed based off of, and by wealthy, you know, I don't mean rich, but I mean we know where our next meal's coming from. Uh, time has a flexible quality to it. It has, while we can't control it, it certainly has, um, it seems to work with you, not always for you, maybe for the rich it works for you, but. This is how time, I think, works in poverty in a, in a great way to say it. Don't worry, son, we'll eat soon. We said the same thing many times. We'll eat soon on many nights. We'll eat soon. The club remained closed. Time passed. Time happened. But sometimes nothing else did. So I highlighted that whole section for just two words. Time happened. Not just passing. Time happened. It's something that happened to them. It's something that happened without their consent, you know, and, and I know that time does that for everyone, right? I, I, I do understand that, but I, I, I want to emphasize that I think there's something, there's a reason that that phrase and clause came after the we'll eat soon, right? Because it really does speak to something unique about time and poverty. So page 194 describes a feeling that I have felt many times in my life and only once, I think, in a song lyric by an indie rock band and I think it was the late 90s, have I heard something like this expressed. Listening to my dad speak, I started missing him right there, even as I sat beside him, devastated by the thought that began to form as he gave his toast. This beautiful man is going to die one day, I thought. And as he continued in his outpouring of emotion, I missed him even more. I said a silent prayer to try to make myself feel better. So I, I highlighted the whole part to get the feel of it, but what I'm, what I'm struck at is missing someone who is right there. And I'm sure there's a language that has a much better word for that. Here in English and in America, we don't, we don't have that. But it's like hard to remain present because you feel the weight of a future sadness, of a future loss, and you're already missing them. So you're already in two places and once you of course are in the presence and seeing that person, being with them and feeling them, but you also are years, months, however long it is away when you are alone and without this person who is your North Star, your foundation, and, and feeling both things simultaneously. Since I said star, I am gonna briefly stop to talk a little bit about the father and his imagination, which is just huge and explosive and beautiful. The schemes that he comes up with to try to get them out of poverty are, are wonderful. Some of them are funny, some are touching, uh, madcap, but one of the things he does is he has this black crayon which is getting duller and duller because he can't afford crayons. And to make art in their home, to make their home, you know, more of a home, he draws pictures of, of cows or pictures of a sun and in, in one case, picture of a star <clears throat> that he draws on cardboard and gives to his son as a necklace. And that creating their world through such limited means is a theme, of course, throughout this work. And I really love that. I love the father. He is an incredible character. Obviously, I, I have an eight-year-old son, and it, it was so heartbreaking to read and to feel simultaneously the father and the son. I could inhabit both and and feel the love and the pain from both views because it is a different kind of love being a father than being a son. It is a different kind of pain being a father and being a son. And uh, that was tremendous. So I'll end my, the reading portion with something, you know, about imagination 
as well. Page 199, this just kind of gets it coping at their circumstances through imagination, which of course, as I said, happens throughout. That's what we did on those nights. We remembered the possibility of violence, while at the same time learning how, beyond our world, millions of light years away, there were places of indescribable beauty. And I think that speaks for itself, that I think that to have that indescribable beauty be millions miles away, always untouchable, you know, not even something that you could even dream to see and get at, um, really speaks to where they're at, but that they are still able to have that dream has to do with that private hope I was talking about. So the three things I want to highlight, lights. So lights is a very big theme in this book. Um, there are times where they are on a street with no lights whatsoever, no electricity. Um, there are times where they have to steal electricity, so maybe they just have lights in one room so that from the front you can't um, see that they're stealing it. There is Lights Avenue, a major street, and then at the end of the book, lights uh, come back in a very big way, in a way that I won't spoil because it is it would be a spoiler. But so lights are, are continuously through this, and you saw that earlier portion right where I talked about existing and shining, where I talked about where the author, the translator, through the character, talked about um, existing and shining being the same thing. So I think that that's part of it. The city is described as an electric forest, and that's what it feels like. It feels like this very sort of dark, but at times pulsating with light from, from different areas, from different orbs, but, but a forest, something to navigate, something that is scary, something that... Um, even in the portions that, that do have light, um, forebode danger. And I love that electric forest. You will feel that. The setting of this place will really seep into you almost immediately, and you will feel as if you were right in the middle of it. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute with my third little note here. But lights are important, and I thought that was great. You know, when you think about I am the way, I am the light, you know, um, there is that sort of aspect, hope is the wrong word there, but that's sort of saying like, you know, follow me, like lights have this connotation that, uh, you know, when we die, you know, you see the bright light, you know, all of that. And, and this turned that a little bit on its head where lights are sometimes a sign of hope, positivity, uh, sometimes a sign of violence, they are just throughout enveloping this world in their absence and their presence because there's many times where light is not present. The physical light, there's no electricity. And in the times where there are, it doesn't always mean the same thing, if that makes sense. It can surprise you. And so I liked the use of lights. Sexuality. So I told you that there is a large section of this book, primarily in the section titled Roulette. Roulette is a chat room for gay men to go on where you can kind of like, you click, you're sort of video chatting with someone and then you can click or the other person can click and go to the next person immediately. It's sort of this instant gratification, but also like instant rejection. And you can imagine all those feelings if you were doing that, especially if you were just kind of exploring your sexuality and I just want to say that it is very erotic, but, you know, one of, the, one of the things I've said before, I read translated literature a lot because I want to learn and experience cultures that I know nothing about. So one of the things, like in the first third of that section that I struggled with is, is this sexy? Because I'm a straight man. So it was very difficult for me to, like, grasp at first if the roulette room, you know, where, and then a couple of clubs that he went to and stuff, when, when we're getting these very uh, direct, very uh, pornographic images, shocking images, sometimes tinged with violence, but usually about dominance and control, power, you know, our typical sex stuff that we can, you know, you don't have to, doesn't matter who you like, you can understand, right? But the sexuality is shocking in parts in terms of, of the descriptions and how it's written and what's he see, what he's seeing. And 
I, I had a difficult time in the, at first with that section determining if it was supposed to be sexy. Like, was this arousing to, to the, the young man, the young boy? I don't really know. I mean, 20, so we're going to call him young man because that's what I've decided his age is. Or was it revulsive and it was repulsive and it was showing sort of this like darker side of the culture that he was navigating and, and learning to be in well those are my questions at one point and then i kind of settled into this you see that what he ends up finding sexy is himself so as he is watching and participating in all of this new eroticism it comes back to his own body and his own image, his own sense of self that is what he finds sexy and erotic. And I really enjoyed that as I think all, I mean, there's that cliche of like, you can't love until you're loved. But like, it really was an exploration for himself, even though it was with the external, external world. And I love how he, how I started to feel that. Like I felt sexy reading it or I felt arousal reading it as he was aroused but he was only usually aroused like in the context of seeing himself beautiful through someone else and I really enjoy that as for the other stuff you know, I don't think there's an answerable question to my first thing where I was wondering is it supposed to be sexy because um, the roulette the nature of it you're just going image to image image person to person to person well, it's about finding what it is that turns you on. So uh, we don't necessarily know what turned him on other than seeing himself beautiful through other people's eyes. Um, but it was just kind of showing the smorgasbord of, of, of what was out there. And it's just funny because men, I mean, we are a horny, horny creatures. And seeing, you know, men with men, it's like times, <laughs> you know, a million. So some of it is just so much. Uh, but... It, but really, really, really interesting, good stuff to think about. Something that I don't, I don't read enough queer literature. I really should, and um, I will say this is probably the most descriptive of sex, different types of sex in queer literature that I have read. So even the queer literature I do read is, you know, I guess more romantic or more about the circumstances, the unfortunate circumstances in some cases of being queer, the violence around it. Some of that, of course, exists, but not so much the overt, just sex. And there's a lot of sex in this. So there you have it. Now you know. The last thing I wrote is play, and that has to do, earlier I talked about the scene and the setting. This would make such a good play. You have got to be kidding me. Why is it not happening right now? Here's why. Okay, when I read books and they are in um, compartmentalized worlds, worlds that you know are really in in one little tiny little claustrophobic area, I always would love to see it performed live. And here, you know, we've got their house here, where they move over here to maybe one street over. Then there's the bar down here by the sea, and there is the sea where they go as well, and a club right over here, and then something at the very end, which we're not going to discuss because it's a spoiler. These things kind of pop up like he's building the world in front of us. But also with those lights and the light, darkness, shadows, it would be amazing to see a set for it. The characters, I mean, we're dealing with a limited number of characters. And so watching them, my dog is, I'm trying to figure out what exactly Gidget is tearing up. It's like a holiday card. So, I don't know. She must not like the Smiths. Not the band, but the Smiths and the family that sent us a lovely holiday card. Anyway, the, the play, it would be tremendous. It, it, and, and so these characters that, that are so distinctive, like watching them kind of like, you know, uh, ramble onto the screen and do their soliloquy. Like, I just think that would be so exciting. And I, I really, throughout it, started to build up in my head, like, oh, I would love to see this as a play. This would be such a good play. The club scenes where some of that highly sexualized energy and stuff goes on, I mean, those would be incredible. And the right sort of, like, art director could make such beauty out of this. Think about, you know, the walls, right, that I said in the room where we've got the, like, crayon drawing of the cow and the star. I mean, how incredible would that be to be in sort of a darkly lit theater and, and, and watch, you know, come out of, you know, of the stage. So anyway, that's something I just kept thinking. It very much feels like a play. I love it. Somebody make it, you know. Um, so that's it. That's my review of 
an orphan world. I hope I did it justice. I hope I was in the right mind space. There's so much here, and as you can tell, I thought it was beautiful. I want to clutch this thing, um, and I'm so excited about Charco Press. Like this being the first title I read is wow, well, it's just a great omen, and and I wouldn't have found something like this uh, anywhere else. I don't think uh, so. I'm really excited. I'm not going to hold up a book for my next review because the next thing I'm going to do is something that I hate and make fun of everyone for doing, a year-end list. Well, I'm just going to do the favorite, my favorite books I read this year. Of course, since we're in translated literature, things like publication date, throw those out the window. Some of the things that I read this year may have even been published in translation six, seven years ago. And that's okay. In fact, it's good because too many backlist titles get forgotten if they're not the hot new thing. So I'm going to go through the 10 favorite things I read this year. Some of them, the ones that have been on this channel before, spoiler alert, it's making the list. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go into too much detail too. I'll just kind of like present them, you know, and what they are in the order. I will make an order as much as it pains me. Uh, but uh, some of them I'll talk briefly about that I didn't get a chance to review. Uh, and so I guess I'm excited about that. I don't know. It feels perfunctory, but it's also something that I do for me, right? Like, so that I can look back and see these were the 10, my 10 favorite books this year. So thanks everybody for watching. Please like, subscribe, rate, review, what are all the things you're supposed to say? Whatever. Just, you know, thanks for being here. Comments below. If you've read this book, want to talk about it um, or anything else, I'd love that. You can find my Twitter and all my social media right there and be good to folks.